Did you ever wonder what would happen if one of the astronauts got a toothache while orbiting the Earth? Well, one of these gentlemen knows the answer. What is your name, please? My name is Jack L. Hartley. My name is Jack L. Hartley. My name is Jack L. Hartley. Only one of these gentlemen is the real Jack L. Hartley. The other two are imposters and will try to fool this panel. Tom Poston, Peggy Cass, Orson Bean, and Kitty Carlisle on To Tell the Truth. To Tell the Truth is brought to you this evening by New Denture Cream, the special denture toothpaste made with the cleaning power denture wearers need. Denture Cream. And now, here's our host, Bud Collier. Thank you very much. Welcome once again to the Tell the Truth. Good evening, Tom. Good evening, Now, in front of you, I'm sure you'll find an envelope. Open it up and follow along with this first story. First time you've seen it, first time you've heard it. I, Jack L. Hartley, a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force, am a pioneer in astrostomatology the science that deals with the dental health of men in space. Along with a team of technicians at the Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine, I developed three pieces of dental equipment, especially for our future astronauts, on prolonged trips through space. The first is an electric toothbrush that will not interfere with the capsule's radio communication. The second is a digestible toothpaste. And the third, a compact emergency kit, which contains all the equipment needed by astronauts to perform dental work on each other while in orbit. It includes a hypodermic syringe for local anesthetic, a lighted dental mirror, equipment to replace lost fillings, and forceps to pull a tooth as the last resort. I call my do-it-yourself dental package the Buddy Care Kit. Signed, Lieutenant Colonel Jack L. Hartley. <laughs> These three gentlemen all claim to be, <clears throat> excuse me, Lieutenant Colonel Jack L. Hartley. A little frog there. <laughs> Let's start the questioning with Peggy Cass. Peggy? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, number okay. three, who drives while one is in the chair and the other is drilling? <laughs> 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 this is all in the future. I think that'll probably be decided tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow? Well, how about that? <laughs> That's figurative. <laughs> oh, I see. Number two, uh, are you, you, uh, did you make a transistor uh, uh, electric toothbrush? Is that what it is? Uh, yes, we did. Thanks. And uh, number one, how long will the electric toothbrush go on uh, if, on a long trip? How long will it last? It'll last about uh, two weeks. Two weeks. And that's as much as the longest trip is they're going on, right? <laughs> right, for the present. Number three, is there any oil of clove in your little kit? <laughs> that was oil of spearmint. Oh, is that the same? Is that, that's supposed to be for toothache, right? Oil well, of clove? It's for good taste, and it acts pretty much the same as all clothes. Number two, why do you have to digest the toothpaste? I wouldn't want to eat toothpaste. Well, um, you see, there is no uh, uh, way that they can actually get rid of water or toothpaste. Oh, I see. And they would have to ingest it. Oh, good luck. Arson <laughs> Yeah, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Uh, number one, now, if you digest the toothpaste after brushing your teeth, aren't you swallowing all the harmful gook, too? I mean, uh, all the stuff is supposed to be gotten out and getting rid of I think so. Yeah, it could lead to indigestion or something. <laughs> no. Number three, I mean, uh, are you going to go on with this? Will you be able to have emergency appendectomies and all that good stuff up there, or what? How far will this do-it-yourself surgery go? Well, oddly enough, the only cause for any abortion in the tests have, have been dental trouble so far. Has it really? Is That's that true? true. Tell That's me about true. that number three. Well, they've, they've had them, you know, and in, in locked up there for up to 60 days now, and uh, they're going further in the future for Apollo and whatnot, and so far the only course for any physical abortion has been some dental trouble. That's fascinating. Number one. Uh, Kitty Carlisle. Uh, number one, I didn't want any of the children to hear this, but what would happen if they didn't brush their teeth at all for a while? For a short while, no problem. Well, for how long? When you talk about 30 days, that would be they bad. They would have some troubles. Well, I hope the children are listening then. 
Number two, what is weightlessness? All next year, they'll brush their teeth once a month now. <laughs> <laughs> and swallow the toothpaste. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, what does weightlessness do to an operation, let's say, of, of a dental kind? Number two. What, is, what does weightlessness do if you have to apply a, a, a hypodermic, let's say, in the uh, jaw? Well, you would, you would have to um, have the partner sort of strapped in very well, and then you can apply, uh, you can uh, Thank inject. Thank you. Number three, who teaches these boys to do this? We do. How long does the course take? Five days. And in five days they can learn to do this thing on each other? They can learn enough so that uh, the emergency procedures that we Thank recommend you. can be Number helpful. one, why is it that they... Tom Poston. <laughs> Number one, that's uh, slightly less time than it took you to become a dentist, isn't it? That is correct. <laughs> Number one, what is oil of clove used for traditionally in the uh, care of teeth and so forth? It uh, reduces pain. And does it, number one? Yes. I always thought it did. I just wondered if it did. Number yes. two, uh, how do you keep a mirror from clouding when you're using it in a patient's mouth? Well, sometimes they cloud and sometimes they don't. How do you keep them from clouding up? Well, there's no real way to keep, to keep it from clouding, but you do take a sponge and dry it off if it does cloud. Sure. And well, you re reinsert it. Uh, number three, now, uh, what happened, do you have any idea, as a student of all this, what was done in the earlier explorations by crews who didn't have this buddy care kit and so forth? What would they do, for instance, on a trip to the North Pole or Columbus's voyage and so forth? Well, you've heard uh, of what scurvy does to the teeth. You've heard of everything that has happened. It's a pretty good example of not only on voyages, but on land it was going on at the same time on a pretty rotten dental care program. That's it. Time for you now to mark your ballots. Oh, mark them. Swallow your toothpaste and mark your ballots. <laughs> mark them at once without any consultation and, of course, without changing. Once you have marked, vote for number one, number two, or number three. Our team of challenges will receive, of course, $250 for every incorrect vote. All about us, Mark? <coughs> Tom, for whom did you vote? I voted for number one. I, I neglected to find out where they were from, but he, he has a little more color in his face than the other two. I thought maybe they might be from the south someplace and get a little tan down there. Peggy Cat. Oh, I voted for number three because when Kitty asked who taught them, and he said, we do, he meant it. Orson Bean. I saw an old lady gumming a hamburger the other day at the White Tower. I told my dentist about that. He says, you see, there's not only children who don't brush their teeth. I voted for number three on the ground. Uh, number two said that the mirror has to cloud up, but it doesn't. My, the dentist always sticks it in a flame or something. And that uh, raises the heat level of the mirror to the heat level of your breath. Yes, Orson. I can I have other interesting <laughs> facts, too. Some... I'm sure you do. <laughs> Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number three because he got very angry about what he called rotten dental care, even on the ground. And I think he cares very much about this kind of thing, although the other two are wonderful. Very well, the votes are all in and the minds are made up. And we find we have one for one and three for three. Let's go with that and find out now which one of these three gentlemen, in truth, is Lieutenant Colonel Jack L. Hartley. Will the real Lieutenant Colonel Jack L. Hartley please stand up? One. He's right again. Thank you, Incidentally, Lieutenant Colonel Jack L. Hartley is also an honorary chairman of National Children's Dental Health Week, which will be celebrated from February 6th through February 12th. Is that right, sir? Number two, what is your real name and what do you really do? Uh, my name is Sidney Holt, and I am the advertising director for Popular Photography Magazine. <laughs> and number three, what is your real name and what do you do? My name is Jim Fuller, and I'm a radio and television broadcast supervisor working with the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Taking the score, we find you started off very well tonight because there were three incorrect votes that you caused them to cast. That means each one being worth $250, total $750 for you gentlemen to take along and divide. Yes. And we thank you very much for being with us this night. Hope you'll remember it as a happy experience. Good night, and God bless you. <laughs> Our next team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Betty Rollins. 
My name is Betty Rollins. My name is Betty Rollins. Follow along with your copies of this one, if you will, panel, while I read from mine. I, Betty Rollin, am co-author of a brand new book containing over 300 recipes for mixed drinks. My partner and I taste-tested each of the drinks, and we include suggestions for interesting snacks to accompany the beverages, as well as a calorie chart for those who are watching their weight. We have tried to make our thirst quenchers more appealing by giving them such exotic names as Haitian Splash, Dutch Dream, Adults Only, Borscht Belt, Jumping Juniper, Tarzan Dinner Drink, Tahitian Tingle, Finnish Punch, and Viennese Velvet. Our drinks range in mixing difficulty from the relatively simple instant Waikiki to the complex brewing of a violet Afshora. What makes our recipes unique, however, is the fact that not one of our cocktails contains a drop of alcohol. We call our book the Non-Drinker's Drink Book. Signed, Betty Rollins. <laughs> Panel, these three ladies all claim to be Betty Rollins. We'll start the cross-examination this time with Orson Bean. Orson? Thank you, bud. Number three, it has always been my experience that non-drinkers tend to be the types of people who say there's nothing better to quench your thirst than plain tap water. Now, do you think a person like that would bother to mix a Tahitian gimlet or whatever it is? <laughs> well, they probably ought to. They, they need it, I suppose. But do you feel, well, number, number two, do you feel that there is sufficient uh, market uh, among the non-drinkers of the world who, to buy your book? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, well, what age group do you find? Or, uh, like, is it... Uh, well, teenagers especially. Well, yeah, yes. that's true. Those poor souls are not allowed <laughs> by law to have any fun. <laughs> Kitty Carlisle. Number one, uh, when you taste all these drinks, do you, do you swallow them or do you spit them out like wine tasters do? Well, if they're very good, you swallow them. <laughs> However, I did not taste them all. My collaborator, Lucy Rosenfeld, did a great deal of the work. Too. Thank you. Number two, what is a, a violet afshora? Well, a violet afshora is a Persian drink, and it's made from the syrup of violets, actually, and you... I was about to say you brew violet, but you um, boil violet leaves for about 12 hours. Thank you. Number three, what is Viennese velvet? Oh, that's basically um, a milk drink, and it has... Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, it has cinnamon in it and some other things like <coughs> Sounds that. Sounds delicious. Oh, I couldn't have cut that off then. Huh. <laughs> yeah, I should say. Number three, again, please. Uh, have you ever used anything with uh, pomegranate juice? Pomegranate juice? Um... I think there's one, there's one recipe with pomegranate juice, but that's all because it's not very easy to get. You don't know what it is. Number two, there's a great Near Eastern drink with pomegranate juice. Do you know what it is? Non-alcoholic. No, I don't. No. Number one, have you used uh, drinks from the Near East? You know, they don't uh, drink alcohol over there, and they have tremendous... Anything with honey, number one? Oh, yes, quite a few have. Um, we have uh, uh, Bombay, oh, Bengal Tiger or something. I've heard they all have odd names. But it has honey, and so does this offshore. Thank you. Peggy Katz. Uh, number three, you should translate this book into Arabic, because they don't drink. And you might have a very big sale over there. Right, I do. Now, I would like to know, since it's non-alcoholic, why you call one of these drinks adults only? You sneak a little in that one? <laughs> <laughs> what is adults only, please? One. Oh, I beg your pardon. Adults only is a clam juice-based huh? drink with uh, Tabasco and lemon juice and so forth. And we call it adults only because children generally don't seem to like it. <laughs> I can understand why. That's all the time we have. Time again to mark your ballot, so please do so at once, panel. Vote now. No consultation, no changing once you have marked. Mm. Vote for number one, mm. number two, or number three. All ballots. All right. <laughs> Tom, for whom did you vote? I voted for number three, bud. She looks the most like my manager, Jack Rollins, who doesn't drink. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy Cat. Well, I voted for number one because she put in a plug for her partner, and I think the real one would have done that. Or should be. I was raised on Dr. Farnsworth's bile rectifier and liver emotion. That was... <laughs> 
talk about non-alcoholic drinks that could drive you up the wall. I voted for number one, though, because... Uh, <laughs> of her vivid description of the clam juice with Tabasco sauce. It brought me back to the old days. Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number one because it's quite true that children don't like fishy drinks, and also it's not good for children to have tremendously spicy things, and I think number one knew that, so I voted for her. Very well, there we have the votes in, and the minds made up, including a tumbler. So let's find out now how close to the truth we've come in learning which one of these ladies is, in truth, Betty Rollins. Will the real Betty Rollins please stand up? Well, he's great. You may be seated. Now, number one, what is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Mitzi Wilson and I'm a musical comedy singer. <laughs> and number two, what is your real name and what do you do? I'm Jane Lohr and I work at an art gallery and I'm a sculptor. <laughs> now, it's not just that and she mustn't get off quite that easily because Jane... We've actually used almost the entire Lar family on to tell the truth at one time or another. Uh, years ago, your brother Johnny, I believe, was on with us. He appeared on a program. And just a few months ago, on our daytime show, in our celebrity spot, uh, we presented, and the great privilege it was, your father, Bert Lar. <laughs> so it was a great pleasure. Well, in checking the score, we find you did well, too. For the second time tonight, we've had a three-to-one here thing, and that's one correct and three incorrect, and those are the ones you're most interested in, because three times $250 is $750, ladies. Thank you very much for being with us and gracing our show. Good night. God bless you. <laughs> Panel, let's meet our third team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Minnie Dole. My name is Minnie Dole. My name is Minnie Dole. Follow along with your third story tonight, if you will, panel. I, Minnie Dole, as a lifelong sports skier, began to realize that something had to be done to make skiing safer. With the help of a few dedicated skiers and some borrowed money, I put together a small local organization which eventually grew into today's National Ski Patrol. In addition to being a competent skier, a ski patrolman's job is to check the condition of every slope in his area, mark danger spots with flags, test emergency telephones and lines, see that all rescue gear is in good repair, and at the end of the day's skiing, inspect every trail in his territory. Further, he must always be ready to rush to the rescue of injured skiers. Today, at 600 ski areas in the United States, over 10,000 dedicated members of the National Ski Patrol work hard to ensure the safety of our country's millions of skiers. During World War II, it was my suggestion that led to the formation of the United States Ski Troops, the famous 10th Mountain Division, which distinguished itself in the snowy Apennine Mountains of Italy. Signed, Minnie Dole. gentlemen panel all claim to be mini dole we'll start with kitty carlisle kitty. thank you bud uh no whoever you are we're all eternally grateful to you because it's frightfully important number three i must comment on your name however how did you get the name mini it's an old family name uh, named after a light of the same name minute right. light minute have you heard of the minute light in situate yes. massachusetts thank you very much uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh number two what is the color of the uniforms that the ski patrol wear uh, it's a, uh, what we call a red rust parka. Thank you. Number one, do you know where Cortina D'Ampezzo is? No, I've never heard of Cortina D'Ampezzo. Uh, number three, do you know where Cortina is? Is it in the Apennines? It's uh, near Parma, Italy, in the Apennines, right Thank you. near the Switzerland. Thank you. Number two, uh, where would you say that uh, are the most, uh, most found danger spots on ski trails? What are they? Soft spots in the snow or what? May I ask you again? What is the most often found danger spot in a ski trail that your ski patrol would have to uh, alert people to? A rock, I would think. A rock? Mm-hmm. Tom Poston. Thank you, Bud. And number one, do you get paid for, for your work in the ski patrol? 
I'm well, that's a funny direct... way of putting it. I mean, do the, do the 10,000 members get paid? Okay. No, they're all volunteers, except there is a paid corps that uh, helps supervise when the need is there. I understand. Thank you. That was what I really meant. Number two, have you, uh, do you still ski? Yes, sir. Uh, have you relearned skiing, have techniques for, for skiing changed since you started? Yes, greatly. Uh, number three, when you were, how can you make skiing itself safer? for the people who ski, never mind the care and so forth of your job, but how about skiing itself, that you still break? Things. Better equipment and supervision of the areas. Thank you. Thank you, Cat. Thank you. Number two, where did the National Ski Patrol start? Uh, in Stowe, Vermont. Thank you. Number one, what's the most dangerous time of day to ski? In the evening. Thank you. Yeah. And, and number three, when do, at what time do they go and start sweeping the trail? About uh, 7 o'clock at night. Thank you. Uh, number two, where's Vail? I believe in Colorado. Thank you. Number one, how do you get into the ski patrol? What are the tests? It's a rigid. You must first be an expert skier, and you must qualify by passing the judge's test. It's a long haul. You must oh. be an expert Red Cross uh, uh, practitioner. Thank you. Arson B. Number one, let me pursue that. Why would anybody want to do that? If it's a long, arduous work and everybody else is having fun and you're working and there's no money in it, wh why do they do it? <laughs> the first, there is the prestige of it. Second, you, you are there with the skiers, you love the sport. And third, a lot of them, it's free skiing and free toll. Ah. Uh, oh, um, good. Number three, uh, are most of the members people who live in ski type areas? Yes. And they're men and women. And most of them are skiing enthusiasts from uh, childhood. Ah, I see. Number two, is it true that there are some cheats who, who have a fake broken leg in their, in their suitcase and they slap it on and drink the whole time? Yeah. <laughs> That's all the time we have, I'm happy to say. <laughs> Mark your ballots, panel. Mark them at once, without change, without consultation. Vote now, if you will, for number one, number two, or number three. All ballots marked? All right, Tom, for whom did you vote this time? Uh, I voted for number one. Uh, you know, very often we have uh, both contestants and liars on the show that we kind of uh, take to and like. I must say, these guys were certainly a, a friendly trio. But number one looked like he could support the name Minnie, so I voted <laughs> for him. <laughs> Cat. Well, Cortina's in the Dolomites, not in the Apennines, so I didn't vote for three. And I think, number one, that ice is the most dangerous thing, so I voted for two. Orson. Well, I was convinced it's three, and I figured everyone else would vote for three, so I voted for two. Kenny Carlisle. Well done. Kenny Carlisle. Well, I voted for two because anyone who has had a ski patrol in the, in the Apennines would know that Cortina is in the Dolomites. Number one didn't know. And number two said rocks. And I think no matter what the condition of the snow, rocks obviously are the most dangerous things that a skier could encounter. Very well. Again, we have it uh, three against one. We have one for number one and three for number three. Let's find out now. The votes in and the minds made up. Which one of these gentlemen, in truth, is Minnie Dole? Will the real Minnie Dole please stand up? Uh. <laughs> Got smart on that one. Incidentally, Mr. Dole has just written a book about his experiences called Adventures in Skiing. It should be very interesting to all of us, especially after meeting Mr. Dole. Number one, would you tell us your real name and what you really do? My name is Howard Brooks. I'm a consultant for the U.S. Postal Services, and I've never been on ski. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, what is your real name and what do you do? Bob Dunn, I'm a cartoonist, oh. and they'll do it every time. Aha! Oh, yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> well, a pleasure to have all of you here, even though you didn't do quite as well as the others. They probably figured they had to get smart once tonight, so they had three correct this time and only one incorrect, but that's worth $250, and our sincere thanks to you, gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed it. Goodbye, and God bless you. What a night. Good night, panel. Good night. Good night. Good, night. And good night to all of you. Don't forget to join us at the same time next week. Of course, I'll see you tomorrow afternoon on the daytime show. But in the meantime, don't you forget to tell the truth. Good night.
to tell the truth in the Mark Woodson, Bill Tubman production. Johnny Olson speaking. Tonight's program was pre-recorded.